Um, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So I'm going to talk about some very classical stuff in symplectic topology. And since it's a colloquium talk, so I, I'll just review some basic notions so that people can at least understand the statement of the main results. So uh, the, the basic uh, object that we are going to start start is like Liouville manifolds, right? So we start with some, some Liouville domain, which is an exact symplectic manifold with boundary. And the boundary is a content manifold. And you can define a vector field by using, where because it's an exact symplectic manifold with boundary, you have primitive or symplectic form. And this is called Liouville one form. And using this Liouville one form, you can define vector field. And this is called a Liouville vector field. And it's outward pointing along the boundary. And you can attach a cylindrical end to this Liouville domain. And then resulting non-compact manifold is called the Liouville manifold. This is an exact symplectic manifold. And there are some very commonly used examples in symplectic geometry, which is like cotangent bundles of, of closed smooth manifolds and, and stay manifolds, right, which in particular include all the like alpha. Can you assume M bar is compact? Bar means com bar compact. compact. Yeah, M bar is compact okay. with boundary. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like this cotangent bundle. Um, so we are, we are looking at like Lagrangian submanifold in this Liouville manifold. Right? A, a submanifold is, is called Lagrangian if the symplectic form restricting, restricting to it vanishes. And if it's, uh, the symplectic form is, is exact when restricted to this Lagrangian submanifold, which means there is a primitive, which is a smooth function of this Lagrangian submanifold. Then this Lagrangian is called exact. So now this is some, some more advanced stuff, right? Uh, there is a certain invariant associated to this Liouville manifold, which is a version of a flocal homology associated to Hamiltonians. Right? You start with a Hamiltonian, which is defined on S1 cross your Liouville manifold, with S1 being the time factor. And this Hamiltonian is quadratic on the cylindrical N, since there is a well-defined flocal homology group. Uh, first defined by Viterbo, and this is independent of the choice of, of H. And this is called symplectic homology. So if you have a two Liouville manifolds which are uh, symplectomorphic as exact symplectic manifolds, then they will have the same symplectic homology. Okay. So let me give a more detailed introduction to symplectic homology because we are going to use it later. So the symplectic cohomology is the cohomology of a co-chain complex. And this co-chain complex has generators being the one periodic orbits of the vector field associated to your Hamiltonian function. And there is a differential. The differential counts uh, basically holomorphic cylinders. Right? The cylinders uh, is a map. Uh, U from R cross S1 to M, and it, it satisfies a perturbed version of the cauchy riemann equation, whereas the perturbation comes from your Hamiltonian vector field. And because it's a cylinder that has two ends, and we require that the, the asymptotic conditions of this equation is that the, the two ends needs to be asymptotic to the one period orbits of your Hamiltonian function, the quadratic Hamiltonian function. And so most important property for us is that the symplectic homology is functorial with respect to embedding of Liouville subdomains. Right? The Liouville subdomain is a Liouville domain which sits in another Liouville domain. And the, the embedding is an, I mean, onto its image is an exact symplectic homomorphism. Um, if, if you have a Liouville subdomain, then what you have is that, for example, if, if a basic example you keep in mind is you have a plumbing of two cotangent bundle of two cotangent bundles and you restrict to the like one dis, one one, dis, uh, one of the disc cotangent bundles of these two cotangent bundles and this gives you a typical example of a Liouville subdomain right or you you may think you have a surface which is a pair of pens and you have a cylinder sits inside this surface right this is a Liouville subdomain and for this Liouville subdomain, there is a homomorphism, which is in particular ring homomorphism, because on the symplectic homology, there is a product structure, which is similar to the pair of pens product on cohomology. And this is defined by um, counting pair of pens, right? Now you have three, three cylindrical ends, and you ask these three cylindrical ends to converge to Hamiltonian orbits of your quadratic Hamiltonian. So this homomorphism associated to the embedding of Liouville domains, it's basically called Viterbo restriction map because it's restricting to the ambient Liouville domain to its subdomain. And 
this map preserves the ring structure. And the important special case is that when M is a cotangent bundle of, of some smooth manifold, then there is a, so I denote it by air because it's going to be a Lagrangian, right, the zero section. And there is an isomorphism between the symplectic homology with the free loop space homology. But you need to keep in mind that if your Lagrangian is not spin, does not have a spin structure, then you need to uh, use local system of your free loop space homology. Otherwise, this is not going to be an isomorphism. But I, th I think in this talk, we assume that Lagrangians are, are spin for simplicity. So, these uh, embeddings, do they have to be of the same dimension? Same dimension, right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's not functorial if you embed the Liouville domain of it. Not functorial, yeah. Okay. So now we can talk about some symplectic geometry. And one of the most classical results in symplectic geometry is that it proved by Gromov in 1985 and in his paper on um, pseudo-holomorphic curves. And as an application, he shows that there is certain rigidity uh, satisfied by Lagrangian embeddings. For example, if air is a Lagrangian manifold in symplectic vector space, it cannot be simply connected. And this is shown by, I mean, showing that this air must bound a non-constant holomorphic disk for the standard complex structure on CN. Uh, right, because if, if, if it bounds a holomorphic disk which is non-constant, then it's a simple ap application of the Stokes formula that this Lagrangian uh, cannot be exact. But if H1 of this Lagrangian vanishes, then it must be exact, right? This one, any one form has a primitive. So there is a like more kind of modern or more convenient viewpoint which uses symplectic model to package all the information into this invariant. Uh, and this argument uses this fitable functoriality because if you have an exact Lagrangian submanifold inside your Liouville domain, right, you look at its discotangent bundle, it's going to be a Liouville subdomain of your Liouville, Liouville manifold. So that's why the Viterbo functorial gives you a restriction map from the symplectic homology of the ambient space to the symplectic homology of the cotangent bundle of your Lagrangian. Uh, if your ambient space is CN, right, then because the symplectic homology of CN vanishes, this is something that Viterbo originally proved, uh, the symplectic homology of your cotangent bundle of your Lagrangian submanifold must vanish. But this is impossible due to the, the property that I just mentioned because this is a free loop space homology. So it's not going to vanish. So this is a contradiction. What, what is the vanishing homology of CN? It implies the vanishing of cotangent bundle now? Because it preserves the, the product structure. Oh, the unit. So it's almost okay. Thanks. So, I'm going to introduce um, this uh, basic notion of a Maslow index, which is very commonly used in symplectic geometry, where this is some invariant associated to your Lagrangian submanifold. Um, so if you have a loop inside your Lagrangian submanifold, and this loop, because, because CN, right, this, this CN has trivial uh, tangent bundle. That's why this loop gives you a loop inside Lagrangian grass manning. So Lagrangian grass manning parameterizes all the Lagrangian subspaces inside the symplectic vector space of dimension n. So you get a loop in the Lagrangian grass manning and you look at the determined map, square of the determined map, and this gives a map from the Lagrangian grass manning to a circle and you compose it with the original loop. Right? Then you get a map from a circle to a circle and you can look at this widening number and this is defined to be the Maslow index uh, associated to this loop inside your Lagrangian. And if air is oriented, you can prove that this Maslow index is even. And in general, but in general, if you, you don't have CN, you have a general ambient symplectic manifold, of course, this, this fails, but you can always choose a disk which kind of bounds your, your circle, right? Then this in this way, you can pull back your tangent bundle of your symplectic manifold, and this gives you a map from pi, relative pi two of your symplectic manifold to the integers, by still still taking the mapping degree. And what is important for us is that 
right? Because the choice of this, this, this the difference of the choice of disk lies in this, this pi two, right? We need to know what's the effect of choosing like different disks bounding this this loop. Right, the difference is given by two times the first Chen class. So if the first Chen class vanishes, then the above discussion for CN tends to the, I mean, the, the, the more general case. So now I can introduce the, the main topic of, of this talk, which is all things conjecture. Right? Because we know that in a symplectic vector space, no Lagrangian submanifold can be simply connected. So it's natural to ask what restrictions needs to be satisfied for non-simply connected Lagrangian submanifolds, right? So the first restriction is that proved using Viterbo, uh, proved by Viterbo and Alashbur using symplectic field theory is that if, if your symplectic manifold is kind of uniruled, which means for every point there is, a, there is a line, in this case you need to apply to CN, so you require that passing through every point, point there is an affine line, uh, if this condition is satisfied, you can show that this error cannot be hyperbolic, so there cannot be any hyperbolic Lagrangian submanifold inside CN, right? So this is an obstruction satisfied with Lagrangians which are not simply connected. But you can ask, right, for non-hyperbolic Lagrangians, what, what will happen? A typical example is, is the case of, of Tori. What is satisfied for Tori inside the simple effect space, where like Odin conjectured uh, three years later after Gromov said such a Lagrangian torus where bound holomorphic disk of, of Maslow index two. So recall that because this is this torus is oriented, so the, the Maslow index is always an even number. But if the, the but the smallest positive Maslow index can uh, a, a Lagrangian submanifold can have it is this two. So it means that this this C N Right, every Lagrangian submanifold CN is Maslow index two means that these Lagrangians are kind of the, the simplest kind of torus, right? So th this is all things conjecture. This gives additional rigidity satisfied for Lagrangian submanifolds inside CN, and this is proved like more recently by Chilibak and Monk using puncture holomorphic curves. And there is another argument which was much earlier and outlined by Foucault and completed by Iri. And they can get more general result, which means you consider any Lagrangian k pi one space which is spin and oriented, then it also bounds a holomorphic disk of Maslow index two. Okay. Hmm. What does the phrase bounding a holomorphic disk mean? So there is a holomorphic map from the disk to the symplectic manifold, and boundary of this disk is mapped to the Lagrangian. Boundary of this disk maps what? Map to the Lagrangian submanifold. Then two. Yes, oh, okay. so there is a boundary condition. So curve in the Lagrangian. So that gives the loop the in the Lagrangian. Curve in the Lagrangian bounds a holomorphic disk. That's what yes, yes. Bounding a holomorphic disk. Yes, so exactly. So curve exactly. in bounds a holomorphic Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. So this, this Foucault Iris argument is better because it, it gives you some more structures, right, satisfied by by the Lagrangian submanifold inside CN. It does not only totally give you this uh, audience conjecture, but it gives you more application, for example, the classification of like all primitive, of all prime Lagrangian threefolds inside CN. So I'd like to give an outline of why this, uh, what this Foucault and Iris idea is, maybe not, not, not the original proposal, but some, some, I mean, so some motivation or ideas that behind this this argument. Uh, so this is um, due to the fact that if you look at right, I, as I said, if you have a like Liouville subdomains, you have this functoriality of symplectic cohomology. If you don't have Liouville subdomains, you have some symplectic. Sub, subdomain, right? Symplectic embedding of a Liouville subdomain, right? This, for example, you, you have a you have this uh, R5 variety, and you remove a divisor, and the complement of this divisor, right? It's not a Liouville subdomain usually, but but it's a it's a symplectic embedding. And is there a similar version of a turbo functoriality for like non-exact symplectic embeddings, right? The answer is is there is. Uh, but you need to modify the original version of Viterbo functoriality a little bit by adding the deformation of a Maurer-Gardin element, and this Maurer-Gardin element 
counts basically holomorphic planes. In the symplectic cap obtained by the complement removing the removing the the subdomain, which is not exactly embedded, but symplectic embedded into your Liouville domain M. And you can deform the symplectic cohomology using this Maurer-Gardin element, because this Maurer-Gardin element is a Maurer-Gardin element uh, for this air infinity structure on the symplectic co-chain complex. Maybe this is more complicated, but when we restrict to the more concrete example, of a Lagrangian submanifold, a non exact Lagrangian submanifold embedded in your Liouville domain. And you look at this cotangent bundle, right? It's a simplex embedding of some Liouville domain into the ambient Liouville domain, but non exact. In this case, the Maurer Gardin element is just given by counting holomorphic disks with boundary on the Lagrangians. And this Maurer Gardin element, because of the isomorphism between symplectic homology of the cotangent bundle and the free loop sp space homology that I mentioned. The so counting of holomorphic disks with boundary on air defines a chain inside the space of chains on the free loop space. And it satisfies the maurer cardin equation where this Lie bracket is a, is a loop bracket uh, defined by Chase Sullivan and it satisfies this maurer cardin equation. Okay. You said you should be able to find the more Catan element by uh, counting holomorphic planes, but yeah. then you count it by counting holomorphic disks. Yes, because you, you you can I mean holomorphic planes you can project to to air, right? It's it's a the holomorphic plane plane has a has a cylindrical end, and this end converges to some some rib orbit, but this rib orbit is on the like boundary of the disk cotangent bound of air, but then you can project to air. So <coughs> now let's look at the, the specific situation of a Lagrangian k pi one space inside Cn, right? If we look at its uh, deformed version of the turbo functoriality, right? What it tells you is that because the symplectic cohomology of Cn vanishes and the deformed the turbo functoriality should still be a ring homomorphism, it tells you that the deformed symplectic cohomology of the cotangent bundle of air vanishes, or in other words, the deformed version of the free loop space homology vanishes. And it translates to the following identity, right? Namely, the cycle of constant loops should be, should have a primitive, uh, right? Under the deformed differential, the deformed differential is the original differential plus the action of the Lie bracket with respect to the maurer cardin element. That's why you get this identity, but up to like certain energy level because there are certain high energy terms. And this shows that since the original loop space homology will never vanish, this shows that there is deformation. After the deformation, the free loop space homology vanishes, and this gives you a strong restriction on the Lagrangian submanifold. And you can calculate the index of the generators of chains on the free loop space because in this case, uh, this is not the, the free loop space of arbitrary manifold, this is the free loop space of a Lagrangian submanifold inside CN. That's why you can include the Maslow index, right, in, uh, include the Maslow index as, as part of the grading of this free loop space homology. And if you calculate this Maslow index, you get the fact that the, the Maslow index of the primitive Y which is the primitive of the cycle of constant loops is equal to n plus one minus the Maslow index when we restrict to the component of, of this A. Right? A is a class in H1. Right? And if you calculate the grading of the, of the Maurer-Gardin element, it's n minus two plus the Maslow index. But when L is a k pi one space, Right, you know that the free loops homology is supported in degrees from zero to n, just by using the fact that L is k pi one. And you may assume that this chain complex is, a, is supported in these degrees. And this will give you, because of the non-vanishing of these two chains, it will restrict the grading of the, the, the restrict the, the number that, that the Maslow index can take 
right? Because these two chains cannot vanish. So this is a rough idea how you arrive at the conclusion that, I mean, so, so any, any Lagrangian torus inside Cn or any Lagrangian k pi one inside Cn, there must be a, uh, must, uh, there must be a holomorphic disk of Maslow index two because first it must bound the holomorphic disk. Second, the Maslow index is an even number. So, but the Maslow index is larger than one and less than or equal to two, right? That's why this Maslow index must be two. But you may ask what corresponds to the case when the Maslow index is one, right? But there are certain non-orientable Lagrangians, like Lagrangian claim bottles, which is embedded in C2, which has Maslow index one. Okay, but if in the orientable case, everything is Maslow two. D star error. So a disk cotangent bundle of error. That's not exactly why. Because Lagrangian is not exact. Right. It's easy to show if the Lagrangian is not exact, oh, okay. the embedding is not exact. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that means it's okay. Uh, what is S sub L? S, S sub L is a moral Gardin element that you obtain by counting holomorphic disks with boundary on L. Right, in, the, in this picture, right, you need to deform your symplectic homology of T star L, or in other words, deform the free loop space homology of T star L using this small regardant element so that fitable functoriality holds. And, and the call model, can you go back to the next slide? The homology of SL with comma SL, what does that mean? So it's a deformation of the free loop space homology using this SL, which means you replace the original differential of free loop space homology by the, the original differential plus the Lie bracket with this small Gardin element. Deforming the differential by SL? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so by high energy terms, you mean that you have the higher operations L2, L3, and you plug in the by, by high energy terms, I just mean terms with, with A not, not equal to zero. Right, because the, the const cycle of constant loops has A correspond to A equal to zero, there's A in H1 class, right? If A is not equal to zero, if you integrate the Liouville form on this A, then they'll give you this energy of this loop, but I want to exclude all these high energy terms. I'm confused, what do you mean by the Lagrangian sub manifold? Uh, form vanishes. Exact means uh, the symplectic form, because the symplectic form is exact. Restrict to this Lagrangian is a one form. And if this one form has a primitive, the Lagrangian is exact. Oh, that's defined, oh, okay. For example, if- You don't mean the symplectic form to be exact, you mean the- Symplectic form is also exact. Yeah, but it's, it's two, two times primitive, that's what you mean. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Wait, I'm sorry, I just have a- Okay. About the counting homework explains things. Yes. You said uh, exactly. it enters a cylindrical end. Yes. Eventually, it's a, exactly. you know it enters a cylindrical end, or you just you just care about the ones that do that. Whereas the, the cylindrical end is the output, right? You count holomorphic planes. The output is uh, is like the sum of certain reap cores, and you project to the Lagrangian. And and this information completely determines the holomorphic planes. I mean, is this an actual count of homomorphic planes in the thing, or is it just supposed to intuitively? First, this is not rigorously established. Second, I mean, the, the counting of hol holomorphic planes, it's, it's doable because you, you just count certain index zero holomorphic planes, right? It's, it's counting like rigid element in, in a modular space. It's counting what element? The, I mean, you, you assume that the, you look at the, dimension zero component of a modular space and you count right, how many elements, oriented count how many elements is inside this co-dimension zero comp component. This. But this moduli space that you're counting is disks with boundary on the Lagrangian? In, in the special case, yes. In the, in the more general case, it's, it's not. Yeah, so let, let's not waste time on the more general case. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a way of counting homomorphic planes in general? Or are you just using well, you, if, you, if you want a certain number, certainly I don't. But it doesn't matter. You just know that this counting is well defined, it's enough. So you have a way of, I, I mean, this matters to me, I know you don't care, but you have a way of doing it? Right, you, you, you look at the people doing symplectic field series, they, they have this like transversality companionist results of modul, certain modular spaces, and 
Oh, so, of, of certain planes, planes with some property that eventually. Yes, yes. OK, OK. So sorry. Uh, yeah, now I'm, I'm going to state, I, I think now I can start stating what, what I can do. Uh, what I did in this case is that you look at the case of S1 equivalence in practical homology, right? Because by introducing this S1 action of the symplectic co-chain complex, I think if you are free with like loop space, you may regard it as S1 action of loops, which means reparametrization of loops. But in symplectic homology, it's generated by Hamilton in orbit, so there is still an S1 action. Uh, but this S1 action is homotopy S1 action on the chain on the co-chain complex. So that's why it contains right infinite many maps. Uh, these are called like BV operators, higher BV operators, right? And the first the first of these maps is like the differential flow differential, which counts holomorphic cylinders. And the second of this map is a BV operator, which counts like parametrized holomorphic, holomorphic cylinders parametrized by S1. There are higher BV operators, and you introduce higher parameter spaces. So these are counting parametrized holomorphic curves. And so the fact that this, this is a homotopy S1 action is encoded by the, by the identity that if you, I mean, you take delta i and delta k plus i, Right, and you multiply them together, and you have this identity, right? So, so for example, if you take the square of the BV operator, right, you may expect it to be zero. For example, in the case of the free loop certain chain model of free loop space, but if this is not zero. This is like homotop homotopic to zero, so you have higher homotopies, and this S one. You, so because you have this. S1 action on the chain complex, you can build a like S1 equivalent chain complex, right? By using all these operators delta i, you put them in the differential, and you can tensor with the, your original co-chain complex, which defines the symplectic homology, with certain coefficient rings. In this case, I choose to use non-positive powers of u, and I should say here this u has degree plus two because later this u may have different degrees. So this is the definition of S1, one version of S1 equivalent symplectic homology. And using this version of equivalent symplectic homology, there are, you can introduce a, a sequence of symplectic capacities, which is called gut Hutchins capacity. And what they do is that you look at the identity element and the action filtration, right, for every generator. Right, it has a has an action because you can integrate the Liouville one form on this generator on this Hamiltonian orbit, and it defines an action, and the so symplectic capacity C K got touching symplectic capacity is defined by asking this formal variable U uh, with power minus K plus one times the identity in the in the complex defining symplectic homology to have a primitive, and the action of this primitive. Determines the exact number of your symplectic capacity. So, what's the difference between these and the ones that Viterbo defined? Viterbo, Viterbo defined what? Oh, it's probably the same. Okay, it's the same. Viterbo defined. Define define capacities. Yeah, he defined I, this infinite oh, sequence. Oh, I, I I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I should, I should, you should give me the reference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so this this is. Oh, yeah, this, this, uh, according to my knowledge, this is I, I first see this in the in the paper by Garton Hutchins. So the, the but I mean we are not caring about the exact number of these symplectic capacities. Yeah, we only care about whether it's finite or not because for many Liouville manifolds, the C1 is already infinite, and we want to restrict to Liouville manifolds with finite C1. Uh, C1 is not the Chen class, sorry. So it's a capacity. Uh, but there are many interesting examples, right? Including Milner fibers associated to Briscombe singularities, where the C1 is finite. Uh, basically, you need a like low degree hypersurface inside CN, then you will have finite C1. Although in general it's very hard to prove, but fortunately we have this uh, Zheng Yi Zhou's example, right? You have this. Uh, uh, Briscombe singularities, and you look at their Milner fibers. These are low degree hypersurface compared to the dimension, right? And these, for example, you have like cotangent bound of spheres in any dimension, right? You put k to be two, then it's cotangent bound of spheres. So these are um, Liouville manifolds with finite first gut touching capacity. Uh, and a 
proposition also proved by Joe is that if, if your Liouville manifold has finite gut touching capacity, then it's uni rule by C. Uh, in some sense, it tells you that there are not so many Liouville manifolds which have finite first gut touching capacity because this uni rule condition is a very strong condition. For example, if it's R5 variety, your Liouville man manifold is an R5 variety, it tells you that the law called error dimension of your R5 variety is going to be minus infinity, right? So in general, right, the law called error dimension is, is always going to be as a dimension of your R5 variety. So this is very, a small class, relatively small class of real value manifolds, but still there are like infinitely many interesting examples. So now I want to, of course, I want to extend the, the Viterbo functoriality to the S1 equivariant case. And so the so S1 equivariant Viterbo functoriality holds for, for symplectic cohomology. And this is called chili bark formalism, or chili bark map, this map from S1 equivariant symplectic cohomology of M restricted to the S1 equivariant symplectic cohomology of N. So this map is first studied by Lutschev, chili bark and Lutschev, and later by uh, Cohen and Ganatra. And if you don't have a exact symplectic embedding, Right, you have uh, any symplectic embedding of your Liouville manifold into your ambient Liouville manifold M. Then this uh, deformed uh, S1 equivariant with turbo functoriality should also be deformed, right? To, you need to correct by this small regardant element. And this small regardant element is also a chain. It's, it's expected to be, to be a chain inside the equivariant symplectic co-chain complex. Um, and if you restrict to the situation, Basically, still by counting holomorphic planes in a symplectic cap, but you need to put some other restrictions. So, if we restrict to the special case when your Liouville manifold has finite first gut touching capacity, right? If you look at this uh, non-exact Lagrangian submanifold, then this tells you that uh, because of the equation, now you call this equation defining the first gut touching capacity k is one. That's why this this factor defined by U uh, uh, is, is the identity. That's why you have a primitive of the identity of your co-chain complex defining symplectic homology. And in this case, right, if you look at the cotangent bundle case, everything is in, is in the free loop space. You look at chains on the free loop space. And what you have is that the, the cycle of constant loops, which also defines the chain inside the S1 equivalent space, S chain, chain of S S1 equivariant chain, space of S1 equivariant chains, it should still have a primitive. But in this case, the deformed differential is defined with respect to the chain level stream bracket. Uh, but this is not very rigorous because I haven't talked about the chain level stream bracket. Also, this chain level stream bracket is not well defined in the sense that all the examples of, of chain level stream bracket you know is like part of an area infinity structure, it's not really a Lie bracket. So, so this chain level stream bracket is not good for our purposes, and you, we need to modify the chain model to get a good chain level stream bracket. But one interesting point is that if you repeat this argument here, right, by checking the gradings using the assumption that L is a K pi one space, what you get is a different bound, namely this, this Maslow index is from one to three instead of one to two, which means that if you like study on the weaker condition that M is not CN, but Liouville manifold with finite first gut touching capacity, you should be able to get like non-orientable non Lagrangians with, Ma with Maslow index three. So, but if you restrict to the orientable case, everything is Maslow two. So, so this is uh, the main result I want to present in this paper. I'm oh, sorry, in <laughs> this talk. So, so, uh, this is a generalized version of all things conjecture. It turns out this generalized version is still true. So to talk about holomorphic disk, we, we need to like fix a certain suitable complex structure. And this complex structure is called like contact type complex structure, which is compatible uh, with the uh, Liouville one form, or in other words, a contact structure on the cylindrical end because the boundary of a Liouville manifold is a contact manifold and cylindrical end is half simplectization of the contact manifold. So for any such good complex structure, what I can show you is that 
if M is a little bit of a manifold with finite first got, touch, got touching capacity, of course we need to assume that the C1 vanishes or two times C1 vanishes. And L is any orientable spin k pi 1 space. Then for any such complex structure, L bounds the J holomorphic disk of Maslow index 2. So this generalized the previous work by uh, Chilibak Monk and, and Fukaya Iri. Uh, to a more general class of Liouville manifolds. And this is sort of like a more general setup for all these conjecture. And if we use some knowledge of like three-dimensional topology, we will get a classification of prime Lagrangian threefolds inside six-dimensional Liouville manifolds with finite first cut Hutchins capacity. So the original classification due to Fukai Iri says that inside CN, any prime Lagrangian three manifold uh, is S1 cross an orientable surface. But now you need to include one more possibility, namely air can be a spherical space form. The reason why this is true is that you look at the cotangent bundle of any spherical space form, you can show that their first got touch capacities are finite. Okay. Can you this spherical space form? It's some, some quotient of the of this finite group quotient of the sphere. Yes. Wait, I'm sorry, I have a question. Uh, you, you said this is a generalized uh, audience conjecture, but I thought the original one didn't have any specification on what J. So you, the original version, you have a natural choice because it's CN. Oh, it's for CN with the standard complex structure? Yes. Yeah, I see. Oh, yeah. I, see, I, see. I thought it was for any compatible with. So, so to prove, so I now, I, I will start to describe the proof of, of this generalized version of all things conjecture. So the, the proof uses the chain model. So re remember that I, I told you that I need to modify this definition of the string bracket so that it becomes a Lie bracket, a strictly defined Lie bracket instead of this uh, part of an area infinity structure. Sorry, I, I, I don't like to mention this area infinity structure because I, I know maybe most of you are not that like this higher structures, but uh, it's a certain generalization of the, of the Lie bracket and the Jacobi identity, you can regard it as the Jacobi identity, identity on this Lie bracket holds up to homotopy, okay? So this, uh, so I need to start with this chain model defined by Iri, and this is a Durham chain model, or in other words, this is some, some mixed version of a, of a Durham chain model of the free loop space homology, or, and, and in some sense, uh, uh, singular chain model. So this, this generators of the degree n, the RAM chain model of this free loop space, right? This A means uh, H1 class, so the free loop space decomposes according to H1. Uh, so it, it's a space of, of triples where U and U is uh, oriented some manifold inside Rn. This phi is a smooth map from U to this Rk plus one, right? Because we, the iris chain model uses not just the free loops, but free loops with marked points. So you, you may regard it as like, originally you have this like free loop space homology, right? You have this chains on the free loop space, but in some sense you want to have a more discrete version of chains on the free loop space, right? The, 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 if you are familiar with this stuff, a natural choice, you look at like certain Hochschild chain complex, and Hochschild chain complex is discrete. And that's why you want to introduce these additional marked points to make it in some, some sense more analogous to a Hochschild chain complex. So, so more, loops. more loops. More loops means you, you have like certain, certain paths which have certain lengths, and you combine these certain paths together, you get a loop. And this is a more loop. You, of course, you have like additional marked points. What is the number A supposed to be? Hmm? What is A? A, A is H1, H1 of, your, of your manifold. Right? I, I've just, like omitted this air. Right? This air K plus one is always means the free loop space of air, but the elements are loops with K plus one marked points. So A, so, so L K plus one A means that those loops that in the class A. Yes. Yeah, so 
so an, another piece of data is like you need to choose a compatibly supported differential form on this manifold air. Uh, and the differential is just the and the dimensions. So, so this the RAM chains is the space of this triple. Whereas this more originally this may look like unnatural, but I mean it, it becomes natural if you work uh, with like Kranish Kranish structures, right? Otherwise it's it's not going to be very natural, I guess. So and you, you have this the RAM differential and it gives you a chain complex. A good point is that this chain complex has has this well-defined fiber products which correspond to loop products because you have this isomorphism between the, the cohomology of the Durham chain model of the free loop space with k plus one marked points with the original homology of the free loop space. Okay. So I'm sorry, this is not very elementary, but. Um, so the right. Yes. Uh, the reason you take more loops is because the composition is associative on the nose instead of the homotopy, something like that. There are, there are many reasons. I, I think you, what you said is one, one of the reasons. But the main reason is not, not this, I What's think. What's the main reason? I, I think the main reason is, is you, you, when you, you, the main reason is you want it to make it an analog of the Hochschild chain complex so that there is well defined like chain level loop record. I think this is the main motivation for you to introduce this notion, right? This this K, K marked the points. I see. Okay. Yeah. Oh wait, that's why you introduced the K marked points or not? Really introduce this K marked points. And it's also like if you look at like certain moduli spaces of holomorphic disk, you usually put point, points, marked points on the boundary. But the main algebraic reason is that you you have an analogous structure of the Hochschild chain complex. And you have a actually we have a well defined BV operator on this Durham chain model. Right, if I abbreviate, uh, I abbreviate the notation so that the C star K already means the Durham chain complex of uh, loops with K plus one marked points. And it has a distinguished element which is essentially the identity element. This L prime, remember that it's some manifold inside Rn. In this case, we just take it to be some manifold which is diffeomorphic to L. And this I zero is inclusion of constant loops. This phi is a diffeomorphism. And this one is a constant differential form. And now this, uh, on this uh, chain model, as I said, because it's analogous to the Hochschild chain complex, that's why this rotation, right, originally the BV operator is by, defined by rotation of loops, but now it's defined by cyclic permutations of the marked points, right? So you make things discrete. And this, this, you have this well-defined definition of the BV operator, and you can check that under the aforementioned isomorphism between the cohomology of the Durham chain model of the free loop space homology, this corresponds to the usual BV operator defined by rotating the loops. Um, and because I want to talk about the S1 equivariant chains on the free loop space, right? So the original work of ERI is not enough. And you, if you want to talk about S1 equivariant chains, you want to make this S1 action, homotopy S1 action, uh, defined by this BV operator, a strict S1 action, which means you take the square of BV operator, it's going to vanish instead of like homotopically vanish. So in, for this purpose, I need to pass to a quotient, quotient of non degenerate chains, you can define certain chains that degenerate and quotient by this subcomplex, you get a quotient complex, which is quasi isomorphic to the original complex. And this gives a chain model of S1 equivariant chains on the free loop space. And in this chain model, it's important to notice that this U has degree minus two. That's why I dare to take this non positive powers of U, because if, if I mean, if I take like I mean, if, if I want to recover this S1 equivalent version of uh, free loop space homology, I should have taken 
uh, positive powers of u, but actually I take like negative powers of u. The reason is that there is an isomorphism in this case because I do not take. Well, this is a subtle point. Let me let me omit this. But in this case, there is isomorphism. Sorry. Grading of total, it, it's complicated. It involves some muscle law of index and, and k, so I'm not going to mention it. So, so it's in fact still not enough after I pass into this quotient of non degenerate chains. Although it's a strict S1 complex, you still don't have a well defined stream bracket as a Lie bracket, so actual Lie bracket of, of degree one. So instead of having an all DGRA structure, all DGRA means you, if you shift globally the grading down by one, it, it's going to be a DGRA. So in order to have this all DGRA structure, I need to pass to a second quotient. And this is also natural because as I said, right, the original Iris chain model is analogous to like Hochschild chains. And that's why, and it's in fact, strictly speaking, it's called co-cyclic chain complex. Right. Strictly speaking, it's, it's some generalization of the Hochschild co-chain complex. And what you do is that you can talk about its associated Combs complex by passing to a further quotient. And after this two-step quotient, you get a chain complex which is called C star lambda. The reason you can, you can define this Combs complex is that you have already have this cyclic permutation operator just in the case of a Hochschild chain complex. So, in fact, this projection, the natural projection, we call that this, this C star S1, right? It's of the following form because this uh, uh, Combs complex is a quotient of the non degenerate chains. That's why there is also a quotient map from the S1 equivariant chains to this Combs complex. And you can show that this is a quasi isomorphism. Uh, but this is, well, this is related to the fact that why I can choose like negative powers, but let me omit all these points. So, now we can define the chain level string bracket, which is a very good definition because it's a, it's a Lie bracket which satisfies the Jacobi identity. And this definition, as you can see, is a, a little bit complicated. Uh, suppose you choose like two chains and you first define it on the S1 equivariant chains, but you realize that on the S1 equivariant chains is not going to be a strictly defined Lie bracket. And then you pass to the quotient, you find that it, it's a, Lie bracket because the, the reason why it fails to be a Lie bracket on the larger complex of S1 equivalent chains is that you, you don't have cyclic permutations. Up to cyclic permutations, a Lie bracket. That's why I quotient to this, I pass to this Combs complex. And the a natural question is how, how I find this formula where if you start with like just a, all these chain models and you want to define this chain level stream bracket, it's hopeless. But fortunately, you have some motivation come from the an analysis of the, of the relevant moduli space, and from these moduli space, you can guess what the formula is. And after guessing what the formula is, you realize that it's, it's not cracked, it's not a Lie bracket, but up to cyclic permutation, it is. That's why I realized that you need to pass to Combs complex. Okay, so this is a, refinement of the, of the stream bracket by Chase and Sullivan for Iris chain model. Is, is the same thing true using Z coefficient instead of real coefficient? Not true. You need to use the fact that you, you are working over a field and this field contains the real numbers. Otherwise, this, this theorem, this quasi-isomorphism does not hold. For the Combs complex? Yes. Thanks. So, not Do you expect a chain level street bracket over Z? I, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I never thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so finally, I'm going to talk about the relevant moduli spaces. Right? So what, what kind of moduli spaces I'm going to use to construct? Remember that I need to construct this uh, Maragadan element. I need to construct the chain which serves as a primitive for the chain of constant loops, cycle of constant loops. So the moduli spaces I use is a modification of the moduli spaces introduced in an unpublished paper by Cohen Ganatra. So the domain of the moduli spaces of holomorphic curves that I'm looking at is a puncture disk with boundary marked points and interior marked points. And these interior marked points are required to satisfy this 
this condition, right, they are, con they are ordered according to the uh, radius. And the difference with the original definition of cone Ganache is that they, they, they are starting it in the case of an exact Lagrangian, so there is uh, no marked points on the boundary, and the interior marked points are not controlled in half disk, they require it to, to be in the interior of this disk. The reason I want it to be in this half disk is because I already have marked points on the boundary, so I don't want them to mess with the marked points on the boundary. So now you, you look at the you look at the, the maps from these domains to your simple, to your Liouville manifold with boundary on air because this is a puncture holomorphic disk. There's a puncture and there is boundary. And the boundary is required to map to your Lagrangian submanifold. And the puncture is required to map to certain chains, co-chains in the complex defining symplectic cohomology. Right? This co-chain actually comes from the uh, finiteness of the first gut touching's capacity. So I'll mention this later. Uh, but you can define these modular spaces. Uh, these modular spaces are, right, you don't have like a usual like regularity results, but they are Kuranish spaces. They have Kuranish structures. Um, and you need to choose certain flow data in order to write down this flow equation. Right? You have this Hamiltonian, which is domain dependent, but should be independent near the boundary of this surface, and this almost complex structure should be constant near the boundary of the surface. And there is a subclose one form for the purpose of maximum principle. Uh, so you can analyze the boundary of this modular space, right? Where uh, so the boundary of this modular space has several possibilities, right? Because you have a puncture, it can happen that certain cylinders break off from the puncture. So this first possibility is that you have certain cylinders break off from the puncture. But because I have this interior marked points, P1 to PR, right? There are certain interior marked points which can be inherited by the cylinder, right? So there are also a possibility that because I, I require this uh, marked points PI to be like strictly ordered, ordered, but if they are not strictly ordered, it creates a boundary component. And this P1, I require it to be less than one half, but it's equal to one half, there is a boundary component, and there are disk bubblings. And depending on like, the, the marked point Z0, right, lies on which components, there are like two different kinds of disk bubblings. Uh, so this is basically how the modulus, the compatification of the modulus spaces goes. An important fact is that you need a, a cyclic invariance results of the Quranish structure because you need to do this cyclic permutation of the boundary marked points and you need it to be compatible with the chains defined by these, by pushing forward the, the virtual fundamental chains of these modulus spaces. And this is the case where you have this P2, right, the radi radius of P2 goes to zero. So two marked points are inherited by the, so this, this one is a cylinder because it's sphere with two punctures, and there is one remaining marked point on the main component, which is a punctured disk. So now I'm going to talk about the, the cold chains that you use in defining these cone ganache moduli space. And the cold chains come from the fact that the, the gut touching's capacity is finite. So this is, this identity, right, uh, the sum equals to E comes from the fact that the, the first Cartagena's capacity is finite because you have a primitive of E on the S1 equivariant differential. And S1 equivariant differential involves all these flow differential and, and higher BV operators. So the left-hand side is the S1 equivariant differential applied to an S1 equivariant chain, which is defined by taking the chains in the symplectic, so in the complex defining symplectic module tensoring with certain powers of U. And using these modules, by plugging in these chains, right, you get these modular spaces, cohen ganache modular spaces, and then you have certain evaluation maps of these modular spaces, which makes them define chains in the chain models that I have mentioned. Right? First, in the S1 equivalent chains on free loop space, and then project to cones complex. And you have these well-defined chains, and they serve as finite energy approximation of your primitive Y of the cycle of constant loops. So you, the, the 
actual argument involves this uh, first you do finite energy approximation and then you take the limit. So, so this is the, the final slides I'm going to explain how like each terms appear in the Mm, I think the identity is a very early identity. Yeah, this identity, I'm going to apply how like every term appear in this, in this identity, which says that the cycle of constant loops has a primitive on the S1 equivariant differential. So first, right, you have this co-chains come from the primitive of the identity and if you sum up all the contributions of the cylinder bubblings, cylinder breakings, what you get is a moduli space with this input being the identity instead of a Hamiltonian orbit, which means it's a critical point of a MOS function instead of Hamiltonian orbit or constant orbit. And if you push forward this chain, it defines essentially the, the chain a chain whose low energy part is a cycle of constant loops. And if you have two points where so they are not strictly ordered, then unfortunately this, this structure does not contribute because of the reason that you are working over non-degenerate chains because they are going to contribute to the degenerate chains. And there is a stratum which corresponds to uh, when P1, the so most outward uh, marked point, goes to one half. And this chain is going to contribute to your BV operator because you care about how this marked point lies on the circle radius equal to one half relative to all these marked points. And you can show that this contribute to the, exactly the BV operator, right? You can imagine it's a cyclic permutation. And so disk bubbles and disk bubbles contribute to the Maurer Gardner element as expected. That's why finally, right, by analyzing the boundary of this moduli space, right? The first term is the boundary of the moduli space. Second term is disk bubbling. Third term is this first stratum coming from ceiling the bubbling. And this last term comes from this uh, uh, cyclic permutation. So we have this identity. And if you remove the last term to the left-hand side, you get the definition of the S1 equivariant differential of this S1 equivariant chain, Y tilde. And this completes the proof. And this is just an illustration of the fact that um, when, oh, sorry, I, I think, yes. So because you know the original definition of the BV operator does not only involve cyclic permutation, but involves, where is the original definition? It involves this, this, this loop product with, with this identity element. And this corresponds to the fact that you can regard this thing, right? When this marked point P1 goes to the boundary, you can regard it as a, like bubbling off of a constant disk, and this is exactly a uh, loop product with this identity, and this finishes the proof. So let me stop here. Okay. So what does the, this point, uh, the Nantra modular space do conceptually? So do they provide cycles with respect to the twisted differential? Or the differential? Well, they, they, they provide, as I said, the, the primitive of the, of the cycle of constant loops. So this is what? So, what? The, so the boundary of those a bunch of modular space is, is, is the constant loop. That's, that's the conceptual? Yes. The, 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 the boundary of the cycle defined by those modular spaces, yeah. And, and then you take boundary, take, use the standard boundary or the twisted by the mark of Twisted. Twisted, yeah. Oh, so, so, so that, that proves that's, that's zero in the... Yes, so, so that, that proves this identity, this, uh, this, uh, this identity which is enough for the, for the proof because this is analogous to the previous identity where you don't have the S1 equivariant differential but the usual differential. Here you deform the S1 equivariant differential using the chain level stream bracket. So if you continue the proof, you can show that the cycle of constant loops is 
compact ambient spaces to obtain that kind of inequality, yeah. which I proposed many years ago, just use yes. some suppose that L is a unirational yes. to take this slide. Yes, and I know you, that. You say that it has a bubble as a constant loop. That looks somewhat similar. So it is somewhat Yeah, and I know it's similar. I want to generalize it to like a more general uni rule, like compact symplectic manifolds. Yeah. Can you say anything if the higher capacities are finite? Higher, I, I, I don't know where, what, what's the usage of the higher capacities. Like CK? Yeah, yeah. It's still sort of unit rule with CK is finite. So. Yes. So if, if the, the following is easy to show. If you have a Liouville manifold, which is C unit rule, then it cannot contain any, ex, any exact Lagrangian submanifold, which is non positively curved. But can you prove this for like? or non-positive, because non-positive curve is like more strict than, than k pi 1 because you sacrifice the condition of c1 is finite, but you already require unit rawness, but can you show this for like all the non-positive curve, the Lagrangians? So this is the question, this is interesting. But you don't have these chains, I mean, you don't have these, in the higher capacity case maybe you have, but in general if you see unit row, you don't have these chains which serves as primitive of E. Yes, so that there are this paper right written like quite recently by by Elsa Keating. She con she constructed in certain hypersurfaces in in C C four and C three with high degree polynomial defining by high degree polynomial, and she constructed these Lagrangian kappa ones with arbitrarily minimal Maslow number, right? Arbitrary minimal Maslow number. So so this is contradicts with the fact that everything is Maslow two. Yeah, essential condition. Yes. Any more questions for you? Let's take a look.